there, welcome to Farmcraft. In previous videos, I got this 1952 Johnson outboard running again after it sat for 50 years, but it wasn't quite as successful as I thought it was. Check description for links to those videos. Got some more work to do on this thing. One thing I found really interesting is I think three people that seemed like they were very knowledgeable on boats made a comment that they thought it was only running on one cylinder. It's funny because I thought it sounded good and many other people commented on how it sounded great. But you know, a little push mower only has one cylinder and it sounds good too. So I might not know. These guys might know what they're talking about. So let me get this thing started and we're gonna see if it's running on one cylinder or two. All right, that still is amazing to me that those guys were able to hear on a video that this thing was only firing on one cylinder and be right. So let's take a look here. That plug is wet and smells like fuel. I wanna see if that plug is sparking. I know I checked it before and it was, but that doesn't mean it is now. The one on the left is the one that's been doing the running. The one on the right still looks brand new. Like this one you can see, there's no carbon buildup or anything. It actually looks pretty good, but you can see it's been getting hot. It's a little yellow. This one just looks brand new. Wouldn't it be funny if I just got a bad plug? We're gonna see if this thing is gonna spark. All right, same plug, same cylinder, and I'm turning it with a drill up here. I don't see a spark. Let's go one thing at a time. I'm gonna put on the spark plug that I know was sparking. And we'll see if that one sparks. Nothing. This is with the plug that looks like new. And I'm on the other wire now. Oh yeah, good spark on that one. So this thing fooled me. It sparked when I first tested it, but once I finally got it running, it stopped sparking. So, what do we do about that? The answer is we need to get to the points which are underneath this flywheel here. I don't really want to pry to get this off because I would be prying against this aluminum gas tank. Okay. Yeah, I really want to use those bolt holes to pull if I can. I found this puller and some mismatched bolts. Tappy tap tap. Man, she's on there. Man, that thing's tight. Mm. I'm gonna try hitting that with an air hammer. So sometimes just uh, hitting the top like that can shock it loose. Eh, we'll see. Ah, darn if it didn't work. And we're off. So that is a tapered shaft and a keyway. You know, this looks kind of intimidating if you haven't seen this kind of stuff before, but it's, it's really not that bad. These are the condensers, these are the coils, and these are the points right there. And that's a point assembly. In this flywheel, there is a magnet. It's cast in there and that is spinning around. So when that spins by one of these, this is a, 
a coil. Typically these have a primary and secondary winding. So when it spins by this, it induces a current in the primary winding. The primary winding has a path to ground through the points. So when it induces the current, the current has a place to flow and it starts to flow. But then these points can, there's a con, basically contactors here, these points can open like that. They separate, and when they open, that current has nowhere to flow. The magnetic field and everything changes just like that, and the secondary winding then builds up a very high voltage current um, or charge, and that high voltage charge then is attached to the spark plug wire and it creates that spark. So essentially the secondary winding has a path to ground, but it's through the spark plug. It's through that gap of the plug. So it can't do anything until it gets that big current, which happens when the points open. Uh, the condenser is there to prevent arcing across the points. When those separate, if the condenser wasn't there to take some of that, um, it's almost like a capacitor. It's, it's charging up a little bit. It prevents the arcing. If condensers go bad, you get arcing and your points get burnt up really quick. Now these points, just looking at them, don't look bad. When the motor is spinning, this is going around. Well, you know, the flywheel is going around inducing currents in the coils. Well, this right here, let me get a pointer. This here is a, is a uh, eccentric lobe. It has a low side and a high side, and it even says, let me make sure you can see this, it even says top at one point, and that's where it starts to open the coil. Right now, these points are closed. I can see there's no gap there. But if I turn this a little bit, this is going to cam out, it's going to push on that, which is then in turn gonna make that go out. So if you watch, there, they just opened. Now that gap is only supposed to be 20,000, so it's not like a, a big opening. And that, that's why this condenser is necessary because it's not that hard for a current to jump across. Now that one's open and it will be open for a period of time until that cam, there it just closed. So the cam is thick here to here and then it starts uh, narrowing down and allows the points to close. So now this this top here is approaching at this part that is then riding along that cam. So these points should now open with just a little more rotation. There, they just opened. Still open, not moving. And closed. This is the coil that's working with this points assembly and this condenser. So those work. These are not working. Points are closed. So I'm gonna reach in there. This is some 600 grit sandpaper. And then this is just a regular piece of paper to help clean them off, whatever I just took off. And because it needs to be done, this is a general maintenance stuff. I'm gonna do the good side too, but I know these are working. I wanna check this condenser. This is the one on the side that I know was not working. And in order to check it, you check it like a capacitor, but you have to take it off. For testing a condenser like this, you need mega ohms. Range select, kilo ohms. Let's see, they're mega ohms. So that's what they're supposed to do. You know, it starts out around five ohms and it keeps going up. That was the good one. Here is the one off of the bad side, but it is doing the same thing. So I think my condensers are fine. So now I'm gonna pull this coil. And there's no other, oh, look at that. <laughs> Problem discovered. There's just a, a needle in there 
that uh, penetrates into the wire here. All right, well, I can at least check and see if I've got continuity. And I've definitely got nothing here. So that plug wire is no good. Now I must say, I am amazed that these plug wires look as good as they do. There's no reason to replace them. So I am gonna have to figure out what I can do to get a new coil. That might be tough. So I got a little bit of slack on this and I'm gonna cut some off because I can't even get continuity with my meter. All right, well, there's the wire. Yeah, I'm right on the wire and that is the correct wire. So the wire's broken. There's no reason to replace it. So let me just confirm this is the wire to the good cylinder. Yes, it is. And yep, it just pulls right out. Same thing. Just verify that I do have the continuity that I'm expecting to have on this wire. I don't see how I wouldn't, but... What in the world? Wow. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking, even though these plug wires look good, there's no, there's reason, no reason to replace them. They are shot. There are gaps in the wires that the spark is jumping through, but my multimeter can't see the continuity. There's no, there's reason, no reason to replace them. I think I need to replace my plug wires. Okay. Let me go get some more plug wires. Look at that, a part number. I'm gonna see if I can take this whole plate off. I wanna be able to get underneath and attach them correctly. One thing that's interesting about this setup is the spark advance is done right here too. Now, as an engine goes from idle to running full speed, the spark needs to happen a little bit sooner because the engine's turning over faster and the delay between this thing separating and the spark actually occurring is a fixed amount of time. I don't know if I'm explaining that well. But when it's idling, when this thing separates and this thing sparks, that works fine because the engine's going slow. Well, if you speed that engine up, if you do the same thing, you're going to be too late on your spark. So you have to advance it. And the way that works is when I do the throttle here, it's actually moving this entire plate so that the lobe separates the points at a different point in the cycle. So all the way fast uh, right there, we, it's maximum spark advance. It's kind of interesting. All right. Cut the boot off. And this is how it connects to the wire. There's just a, a needle and a spring. This is what clips onto the plug. And the failure point is that needle penetrating into the wire. You know, it's probably arced or something in there to the point that that connection is no good. I had to get a universal set of spark plug wires and they did not have a connection that's so low profile like this. So I am reusing these. They worked for a long time. They can work for a long time more. I think it's just that the wire eventually loses its connection there. Now that I know that, I probably could have just trimmed this off and redone it, but I'm glad to put new wires on it. So here are my new plug wires. And I put some heat shrink here where these are going to get pinched and held in place. The speed control, when this is turning, it's advancing the spark, but right over here is where it pushes the throttle. There is a uh, an angled plate here that gradually pushes that out more, and that's opening the throttle on the carb. You can also see the mechanism that prevents you from going any higher with your throttle when the thing is in neutral. I turn that in neutral, that flips to there, and then that hits. You can't increase the throttle anymore until you put it in gear, and then it'll keep going. So 
So I'm sure people are wondering why I'm not replacing the coils and condensers. Well, if I have to, I will. I am actually thinking that these are going to work. Uh, I did, when I went to get the spark plug wires, ask about them, and they said it was going to be several days. So I figured I'll put on the spark plug wires. We'll see what happens. If it doesn't work, it won't be that hard to pull the flywheel again and just replace those four parts. Now I want to set the gap on the points. And I can see this one's open right there. So let's see. It's supposed to be 20 thousandths. So I've got my feeler gauge. Wow, that's perfect. <laughs> okay. Now that one's a little too narrow. So in order to adjust that, All right, it feels really good right there. Make sure we're still good. Just gonna clean this up a little bit. This is WD-40. So the key is to make sure, <laughs> the key, that the key lines up. Yeah, the key's lined up because it's already spinning the shaft and I haven't even hardly pressed it together. And I watched the key as I put it on. There is no torque spec listed on this bolt. It just says to get it really tight. And that being the case, I'm gonna use this on mid strength and just give it a tappy tap. So at this point, I can put some plugs on it and we can see if we've got spark or not. So this is the one that was sparking before. We'll check that first. Okay, so that was the one that was sparking before. This is the one that was not. So let's see if we fixed our problem. Oh! Yes, we did. <laughs> Sometimes there's enough pop that it goes right through that boot and it gets you. Let's try it this way. It's still getting me. Good spark. All right. Well, I'll bet you with both cylinders sparking, this thing's gonna be easier to start. But before we start it, we have some more housekeeping to do. The water pump needs addressed. So now we're gonna tear into this lower unit and see what our water pump impeller looks like. That's gonna need to be replaced. And I think I also probably wanna look at the seal behind the prop. Now, I got tons of comments from people saying that I filled the oil wrong. I am aware that many like to fill from the bottom they, they have a, an attachment they can screw on and they can pump it full of oil till it comes out the top. They put the top plug in and then they put the bottom in and they only lose a little bit. But it doesn't have to be done that way. This is a gear case. There are many gear cases that have no option but to fill them from the top. Like the rear differential on my truck, the axles on my tractor, the gearboxes on my bush hogs. They all fill from the top. You just fill them until the oil starts to come out. For that matter, this actually says fill with hypoid oil, and this says drain. Uh, I checked the manual. The manual even says to fill from here. It's a gear case. It's not the space shuttle. There's gears in here. As long as there's oil in here up to this level, it's going to be fine. Why can't you fill it from the top? Everyone thinks you're going to have air bubbles or something that are going to be catastrophic. Eh, I'm skeptical. It's funny, I had no idea people would be so adamant about that too. Not all of them, but some of the comments are very aggressive that, uh, that I didn't fill the oil correctly. Well, that's not what I was expecting. But, <clears throat> 
You can see it was full of oil. What's going on here? Let's take that thing off. I'm not sure, but I think this thing is just like a Chinese finger trap clutch mechanism. So I did some digging, and what's going on here, this down here is the clutch cable, and it is continuous all the way up to here. So I have to loosen it here and let it slide down that hole. And then that will allow this bottom to drop out, which it's already started doing. Okay, yeah, now that I have that cable loose, it is coming right out. Along with a washer. And something else. So those must have been riding on top of that. I'm going to have to get some uh, parts diagrams to see which way these went. Just kind of covered with chunky goo. Ooh, good so here's the water pump housing and it's on this shaft, uh, drive shaft, it's splined up here. And this is where these, these two things fell off when I was taking that out. So I'm going to have to figure out how those go back on. Well, I noticed that sitting on top of this down here, just loose, is an O-ring. That does not appear to be in very good shape and does fit over that. So that could have come from up there too. And that thing is hard. Maybe this O-ring went around that. That's what it looks like. So here's our beat up cracked O-ring. And this piece has a step on it that that O-ring fits on quite well. And then squish a washer on the other side of it and you essentially have a seal. Well, I must say I'm impressed. This impeller doesn't look 50 years old, but it is. So let's take this housing off. Wait a second, that's gotta come off. Because otherwise you're not gonna be able to get a new impeller on. Does that come off? That looks pressed on. Give me a second to figure out how the heck this thing comes apart. So here's what I've discovered. These two will separate. That has uh, some flats on it, and the bottom of the shaft has some flats. So it will only go on that far. So this is supposed to come off of there. I should have just been able to take this off from the start. But uh, this has burrs on it that are not allowing this to come down. So I need to do some filing and get those burrs off of there. There you go. Now all of this can come off. Maybe. There we go. This guy. Yeah, that's only going to go one way. It's a good thing they made it idiot proof because I'm working on it. And then this guy. There's our impeller. And it has a key in it. Uh, the key is actually this little pin. It just goes in that hole. And then once the impeller is over it, like that, the pin can't come out. And then there's the top. All right, I've got those all cleaned up. So I'm gonna have to order a new impeller. That's gonna take a little while. I still need to see how these things went on, but I did find in my O-ring set an O-ring that fits on there very well. All right, now let's look at the prop. So I just have it clamped here. Why are we messing with the prop? Well, because I noticed an oil leak around it. Looking at some parts diagrams, it looks like there's just a um, an O-ring. So I might be able to fix this without needing parts. <laughs> wow! I'm telling you, people were stronger in the 50s. Alright, baby. 
I want to see an o-ring behind this. I want everything else to look good and I want to have the o-ring so I can put it right back together and be done with this part at least. Hell yeah! O-ring. Ooh, maybe not hell yeah. So somebody got a little impatient putting this together. Something was supposed to line up here and it did not and they just forced it. See that? See how that O-ring is smashed? There's this tab, this alignment tab was sticking out and was supposed to ensure that those things went together right. And someone just cranked down the, the bolts and smashed it right into the O-ring. So no wonder it was leaking. Okay, I got a snap ring right here to remove. Yeah. Look at that, a part number. <laughs> I've been working on some hydraulics. And they never have part numbers. It's ridiculous. So yeah, you can see now that was supposed to line up with this alignment tab there. Just to get those in the proper orientation. Although it seems kind of... I guess it prevents you from trying to do something like that. Yeah, because those are spaced. So you could do that except for that tab. So it just needs to be these bolt holes. The tab really isn't important. So I'm going to get that off of there and uh, see if I have an O-ring that can act as a replacement. Oh yeah, it's not even attached. The surface that the O-ring rides against was just a touch scarred from that uh, traumatic event. And I just filed it a little bit. It's nice and smooth. And I also found an O-ring that looks like it's gonna fit on there perfectly. This really isn't necessary, but while I'm here, I'm gonna take a look at these gears. So there's that drive shaft and you can actually see, yeah, that thing, oh wow. So the gear's totally being held in by this shaft. And now this might be pressed, nope, it's not. It just sticks in there. All right, yeah, those gears look really good. Nothing to complain about. Piece goes in, and our snap ring goes in. And then here's where the alignment tab was. It's supposed to line up with what's on the bottom there. So all we have to do is just line up the screws like that. Oop. Like that. I think that's perfect. That O-ring compressed just a little bit, but not too much. It, it went in, it didn't like get all pinched up or anything. Lining it up with that hole so this pin can go through. And then the prop nut screws over it so that that pin can't come out. Well, this doesn't look good at all. Looks like my Johnson exploded. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna go order some parts water pump. And while I'm at it, I am going to order uh, coils and condensers, uh, but I'm going to try and run it with these old ones. I want to see if they, if they still work. If I'm having any issues, I'll change to the new ones. So I've got two gaskets here I need new ones of, and the easiest way for me to get those is just going to be to make them. So some blank gasket material. Okay, there's new gaskets. Now I need a new impeller, which just got here.
That looks like a really good match. Check and make sure the bore size is the same. My old one measures 440. This one measures, yep, 430. That means it will not go on there. That one's got a little bit of play, so I don't have to take quite 10 thousandths off. How am I going to take off just a few thou from that? Here are my options. This bit would probably drill the exact hole that I need. Uh, the problem is, is there's a keyway in here. And even if I chuck this in the lathe, which I don't really want to do, I'm afraid I'd have to grip it so hard I'll kind of tear it up. When one of the, the flutes disengages because it goes into that keyway, it's going to want to move to that side and it's not going to drill a round hole. Uh, and then it's likely to catch, and if it catches, I could end up uh, destroying the rubber. So my other option would be to use like a die grinder. This is the only stone I have that would fit in there. That would probably work, but it's going to get out of round. I could put it in the lathe and I could try boring it, but that, that also has other challenges. What I decided I think will be the safest thing to do, I just took this piece of 220 grit sandpaper. I used contact adhesive to attach it to a dowel that fits in there well, and I'm just going to use a drill to open it up. Yeah, that wasn't too bad. I had to change the paper a couple times, but now I am measuring just over 438 and it goes on the shaft I need it to go on and fits quite well actually, better than the last one did. So the pump is going to be spinning this way, so the veins need to go, well you need to spin it that way as you're putting it in so the veins bend the right direction. Now this gasket, I'll go there, and then this guy goes on, that. This is the intake hole, that's where the water is going into the pump. Then all the screw holes line up. So one thing I really love about YouTube is being able to tap into the hive mind. You know, I consider myself a jack of all trades. I do a lot, but I, I don't know I'm often figuring things out as I'm working. You know, these gaskets here are a little bit rubbery. I don't think they're rubber, but I don't want to tear one just to see and destroy it because I might want to reuse these. But it's not just straight rubber, it's definitely a gasket. So I'm curious if, if what I've done here, just using standard, you know, paper gasket material for this, if anyone knows that that is uh, not a good idea, uh, please, please comment. This is such an interesting mechanism. Uh, I was reading about it. This really is essentially like a Chinese finger trap. So when you try to turn this in this direction, the spring gets tighter and it grips and it's a solid piece. If you reach down and you push on the spring to loosen it, then the two pieces can spin independently. And that's all that's happening when you engage on this clutch ca cable. You make this little piece come down and it engages with this ear on the spring and basically takes the tension off of the spring and allows it to spin. And this is all encased in oil in the in the lower gear case and somehow that, that works and doesn't wear out. I find that, uh, that fascinating. I've never seen a mechanism like that before but I'm sure they're out there. There it went. That should just pop right on there. There it goes. All right. So do you remember when I took this lower unit off, I had some parts come flying out. There was a broken O-ring, this plastic piece, and I put a new O-ring on it, and then this washer. Those go together like this, this down, and then the O-ring and the plastic piece, and they get kind of get sandwiched on top of this bushing here. Now, here's the problem, is they don't fit tightly around the shaft, and they can't really fit tightly around the shaft because the shaft is rotating, and these need to be stationary. I need to try to get these all to line up way up inside the engine. And let me show you what I'm talking about. So that lower unit needs to slide up into here and go all the way up through this tube, and the O-ring is going to end up like in this area, way up inside there. Not real hopeful this is going to go, but uh, let's give it a try here. The shifter cable needs to go in. I 
Yeah, I mean, there's zero chance of me seeing anything. You are. Now I need that O-ring to go in there and not be destroyed. Sometimes you just have to have a good attitude and a little patience. We'll see if that works. I'm spinning the prop to try to get the splines to align up there. And maybe I'll try going vertical. See if that makes any difference. All the way at the end of that, there is a bore that that O-ring and those two washers need to press fit into. To do it blindly and all the way up there while it's loose on the shaft, I don't know if that's possible. So if I can't get those to line up, what are my options? Well, I gotta come from the top. And that would mean taking the power head off. <laughs> That's funny. It's coming out of the clutch conduit. That's all that is. And this is going to be the water. Yeah, that's the main water line coming up to the end. So that was the horizontal surface. There's also this vertical surface here, which it's actually pretty clean. I haven't done anything to that yet. So here you can see the bore that I was trying to put that seal into. I needed to get that O-ring and those washers to go into that from all the way down at the bottom. Uh, just no way that's going to happen. But now I can put the lower unit in and then put the seals in from the top. There you can see the drive shaft coming up. And when you look down in there, there's that bushing that's pressed on that acts as a shoulder. That's going to go right down and sit on that shoulder. Now the O-ring is on the bottom. So that's going to need to squeeze into that bore. I think I'm going to put a little grease on that and we'll push that down in there. Come on, baby. I'll tell you one thing, there's zero chance that was going in from the bottom. Ah, it cracked a little bit off the edge, so that's not cool. I'm not sure what this thing's made of. Oh, oh, it broke it. Well, looks like I might be making one of these out of metal. So I'm going to have to remake this piece, obviously. And if I'm going to do that, you know, I might as well make this thing better. So the way this thing is set up, the washer is on bottom, then the O-ring, and then, then this goes like that. So basically the O-ring fits in a groove between this shoulder and this shoulder. Why don't I just make that one piece? So I need something to machine this out of that would not rust and is hard, because this obviously has to have some wear resistance, which I'm sure is why they used a stainless steel washer there. I don't have a piece of stainless steel a bar that would suit for that. This is a piece of aluminum bronze. It's hard, it won't rust, uh, it's actually used in a lot of marine applications. It's perfect for this. So I am going to machine this out of aluminum bronze. Had this thing not broken, once it went down in there, the o-ring would have held that in position and this thing would have stayed put the next time the lower units pulled off. But this guy just sitting there loose underneath would have fallen out again and I would have had the same problem how to get it back in. I think if I make this as one piece and that O-ring is intact and holding it against the wall, this thing will stay put and changing the water pump in the future will be easier. So this is the broken piece, 
And there's the equivalent in aluminum bronze, and then that's the washer underneath. But of course they're all together now, so it should be much easier to deal with. Let's put the O-ring on, and bam! We have a seal that should stay in place. This is really one of the joys I have of owning a lathe and a mill. When something like this happens, before this would have ended up in a part search, I would have been looking for this piece, I would have ended up with the same kind of not very great design. But, you know, this took me a half an hour to make, and uh, I'm back in business, in business with something that's hopefully going to be better. Gonna get some grease on this thing. I think that's going to stay in there next time I take that lower unit out. So here's the underside of the power head. I've done some work cleaning this up. There's a gasket that goes there, and then another one here, and this is the exhaust. And this up here is where the water gets pumped into the engine for cooling. This is the main power output. Those splines in there go over the shaft and drive the prop. So I've already taken these gaskets and made some new ones and we're going to put this back together. I think I'm going to be able to slide that gasket in after I set this on. So that's what I'm going to try first. Oops, that's a bad time to remember. You forgot the spring. It goes right there. Springs in the right place, cables in the right place. It came down flat, so that's good. So now I need to get that gasket up in between there. This was an example where having some patience actually paid off. I just had to fiddle with it for a while to get those gaskets to line up. Uh, having some high tack or something on hand would have been really helpful, but uh, but I got it in the end. I'm going to fill the lower unit, and this is going to offend a bunch of people. I'm going to do it the way the manual says to do it, which is from the top. Now, obviously, if you have a fitting to screw into the bottom and pump it in, that's a fine way to fill it, but it's just a gearbox. I'm just going to fill it from the top. It'll be fine. Relax. All right, see, there we are. Give that a spin. Make everybody happy. We'll tap it. Now keep in mind what's in this inside this gearbox. The spring is about right here. The gears are all down here. There is quite a bit of hydraulic pressure so that you're not going to have air bubbles down here of any any size. Uh, especially when you move the gears around like this. And yeah, I mean, see, it just keeps coming out the top. That is definitely full. I always like to give it one last squirt and then throw the plug in. So I was all ready to go start it, and I was just getting it warmed up, and it decided to throw me a curveball. Something else went wrong. just got really hard to pump. Something is not acting right. I wonder if my pump went bad. Ah, more work to do. In spite of the pump, I did get it running, but it was doing a lot of backfiring and sputtering. Definitely still more work to be done. When I ordered the water pump, I also ordered new coils and condensers. I'm going to go ahead and put those on. That'll remove one variable from this equation.
Well, I really didn't want to have to tear back into this carburetor, but the leather seals on this primer pump, uh, you really couldn't expect to just last forever. Wow, there's junk in there. Yeah, it's possible there was still something left in the tank even though I cleaned that out. So the primer pump is down in here and there are leather seals. They must have, have come apart and, and plugged some of the passageways because it really became very stiff to pump. I basically have to reach down inside there and get this brass washer out of there. Oh look, it's just gonna come out for me, okay. Okay, there's that. Yeah, there's one. Oh yeah, look at that, it's cracked. It's certainly seen better days. So two of those and then another washer. That might be it. Yeah, that definitely looks like the bottom of the pump now. Cork looks good. Bottom of the float bowl has a bunch of junk in it. I don't know where all that came from. There must have been something else that got in there because these washers don't look that bad. Most of it is here. Now, what am I gonna do with this pump coming apart on me? See all that junk getting on my finger, just handling it? Fabric hobbling up a couple of these is not gonna be easy. If they were a simpler washer, I think I would just make a couple out of leather, but these are not. It's not even flat on the bottom. It has a V-shape on the bottom. It chamfer here and then kind of a dome on the top. You know, I can measure these and these being so old, the measurements that I get off of them are probably going to be wrong. They're not even the same thickness. These two are different from each other. This one seems to be wanting to leave more pieces. I'm gonna put it with the other one right on top and put it back together like that. Uh, I did find a guy online who's selling these, so I'm gonna go ahead and it's, you know, it's like 10 bucks. He's done the research, he knows what size they need to be. He deserves his 10 bucks. So I'm just gonna order those from him. In the future, once I get those, I'll be able to replace these. I think this is gonna work at least enough for me to see uh, if I can get this thing running correctly. This guy goes in first. One other thing I'd like to do is make a new gasket for this. I also made a new gasket that uh, goes between the carb and the block. Either of these gaskets leaking can cause air to get sucked in and that changes your fuel mix and that can really uh, mess up how it runs. All right, I'm tired of working on my Johnson. Let's see if this thing will run. Hopefully, now that both cylinders have spark, we're gonna start a lot easier. Ah, I can feel the pump priming. Okay, moment of truth. Fire in the first pull. Let's see if it's running on two 
and yes, you can definitely hear a difference when I disconnect one, but it continues to run, so we know both cylinders are firing. So what did Pappy from the Keys and Jacques Poirier hear that kn they knew it was running on one cylinder? Here it is previously. So one more thing I want to do, I'm going to check the compression again and see where we are. Because really, other than uh, than rebuilding the power head, I've been through this whole thing. There's really nothing else to do. All right, I am spinning it up top with a drill. And that is surprising. My compression has only gotten worse. Got up to 66. Let's look at the other one. Same, 66. It runs okay. It doesn't seem to have as much power as I would expect. It's doing the backfiring and it's not perfect. I kind of wonder if, uh, if going through, pulling the head, new head gasket, maybe replacing the rings. Maybe that would really get it going right. What do you guys think? It's amazing how much work there is to do on such a small engine. <laughs> yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. This was fun. At least I got it running on both cylinders now. Uh, but maybe I need to go on and do a ring job on it. What do you guys think? Uh, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys on the next one.